and should also stress if any of you guys know anybody who has a master's degree in in chemistry or biochem um we're looking for adjuncts for the for the uh, winter quarter um a little bit late notice um i think we had uh somebody back out of teaching micro so carl might have to teach micro instead of 102. <clears throat> excuse me so if you know of anybody with a master's in a scientific field even if it's not bio or biochem um let them know if they want some some work teaching virtually um apply apply to ltcc and we can um we'll fast track it and get them get them in there that was a fun surprise this morning all right let's Let's go ahead and uh, practice drawing some chair conformers. Let's try and draw isopropyl cyclohexane. And when you're drawing an isopropyl group, it's kind of hard to actually draw the whole thing attached to a methyl group. So you can use the, um, the condensed form of an isopropyl, um, which is more convenient to write sometimes. A condensed form would be Let's see, uh, C, let's say CH, parentheses, CH, three, two. So if you have this attached to your R group, which would be cyclohexane in this case, that that is representing an isopropyl, right? Because you've got the central carbon that has one hydrogen and then two methyls attached to it. Um, so that's a more convenient way of writing it when we're drawing this. But so go ahead and give that a try, and then I'll draw it on the board. All right, let's stop the share now so we can try it. So, and remember, we're trying to draw both conformers of this. It doesn't matter which one you draw first. Just pick one. You might, um, if you wanted, you could start with the one that was going to have the isopropyl in the um, more stable position, which would be equatorial. Because remember, equatorial. Remember, every carbon on a cyclohexane has two positions for the things that are attached to it, right? It's either going to be axial, meaning pointing up and down relative to the ring, or equatorial, which is pointed away from the ring. So start by just drawing your chair conformer. So that would be our more stable conformer. And because remember the other positions here would be right there, which would be pointed more towards everything else. If I use the red to fill in the other
right? So the when we only have one thing on this on the cyclohexane, just put it in either the point via head rest or the foot rest of your chair conformer. And if we wanted to put this, if we wanted to do the chair flip to put this into the axial position, we're going to wind up doing that by flipping down the headrest. And that brings the, the isopropyl group with it. So the isopropyl group has to move with this carbon. So it stays pointed rough, relatively the same way to these other carbon-carbon bonds. So, and then once we do that, we wind up with a, a boat configuration for a short second. Oops, the other way, upside down bow, that's right. And the isopropyl was equatorial and now it's pointed down. And then if we finish that by then having what was the footrest flip up to be the headrest, there's nothing attached to it. So it doesn't make a difference in this case as to how we draw it really. There's no, there's no substituent that we need to worry about switching from axial to equatorial. And this, if I redraw the, uh, the ax, what was the axial position is now equatorial. What was equatorial is now axial. So key, key concept when it comes to these cyclohexanes, so every carbon has both an axial and an equatorial position. Um, and they're sort of going to alternate. If your axial position is up on the headrest, it's going to be up here and up here. And that's, you can always get back to it by thinking about the 3D structure, remembering you need to have two flat bonds that are in the plane of the board one going out and one going away, right? So that'll always help you. You can always use that to help you draw this. If you remember this bond is really going away from us, then that means there's also a bond coming towards us, pointed in roughly the same direction. And if this bond is flat, there's another bond that's flat. So any, so drawing them, I'm, I'm belaboring the point on, on these examples where it's only got one substitution. And that's because if we can have one substitution, where do you suppose we're headed next? Two substitutions. And that gets th makes things a little bit more complicated because you can't always put both of them at the, point, at the head rest or the foot rest, right? you're limited by what the structure is to, um, as to where you can draw these things. So we need to be able to draw the axial and the equatorial position for, for all of these carbons. Um, this is the, the slide that we went over and finished with the, the other day, um, basically just saying that equatorial is more stable because we avoid these one, three diaxial interactions. If you have two things that are both axial and they're, and they're two carbons away from each other, they're going to be pointed in roughly the same direction, which means they're going to get in each other's way. Just like being a stat in the eclipsed conformation for a Newman projection, um, which I think I have a better, yeah. Um, these only really happen in the axial position, because if we look at this, so this would be if we just had butane in the 
in a Newman's projection. Um, we wind up, if we wind up with the methyl and the second methyl being the Gauche position, remember Gauche just means a, it, that they're staggered, but they're adjacent to each other. If, if we have them in the Gauche position, that's not as stable as if we had them all the way opposite of each other, right? The anti-configuration is more stable. But if you have cyclohexane, you're kind of limited. You kind of have to have them in a Gauche position. But we can do a ring flip, which would essentially be taking this bottom point and flipping it upward, which would force, which would rotate these other two positions. You can picture rotating it outward from the middle. This middle carbon pops upward into that boat configuration. And that moves this from being in an axial position to equatorial. So you only have those one, three diaxial interactions if it's in the axial position. If it's equatorial, we don't see that because it's pointed away from everything else. So this would be after going through that chair flip, we would wind up with that methyl being in the equatorial position instead, which means it's not going to run into that other carbon. It's now in the anti-configuration, despite the fact that we're limited on how we can rotate. We can't rotate freely, but we can do a chair flip. John, you look like you have a question. Um, where, would you go back to that slide? Um, are those on the on the bottom one, um, those carbon numbers the same? I can't quite um, picture how it was flipped. So because of the symmetry, they were they're able to to redraw this in a, in a way that's convenient. I would have switched these two and put this one down and this one up. OK, that's what I thought, yeah. Um, but you could see how that still would wind up putting them further apart from each other. Um, and if we, yeah, if we if we drew our own Newman projection that way, maybe that'd be a good quiz problem. Perhaps have you draw the Newman projection of methyl cyclohexane? Um, then we could draw at both of those positions in a way that might make a little bit more sense than, than the way they have it drawn. Real, I think really what they have drawn here is if they detached the methyl and, re and switched it with the hydrogen, which by doing a chair flip, you can make it look like that, but they didn't present it in a way that where you can easily see the chair flip. It's not technically wrong, it just pedagogically could have been done better. Um, and there, as, as you get larger and larger groups, as you might expect, the more those interactions matter. So methyl cyclohexane was 95% to one or to 5%, right? If you put a, a, a tertiary, a T-butyl group, or also known as a dimethyl ethyl group there, then it's much larger than just a single methane or a single carbon, right? And so instead of being 95% to 5%, it's 99.99% to 0.01%. 0.01% of the time we can find it in the, with the T-butyl group in the axial conformation. And to go back to RJ's question about how much of this is actually real and like measured versus how much of this is is theoretical like these ratios are basically because we can calculate what the relative energies are of both of these conformations we can then plug it in and get an equilibrium constant because if we can if we use if we know that the, there is that the axial position is you know 16 kilojoules per mole higher or probably more like 40 kilojoules per mole higher in energy that gives us a delta G for the ring flip. And I keep grabbing this, sorry, hang on. 
should get rid of this green one. Give that one to the kids. They take all my good markers and then they leave me the green one. Um, so if you have a delta G for the ring flip, that is, you know, 40 kilojoules per mole. We can then take that and plug that into our equilibrium constant expression. Sorry. Which was E to the negative delta G over RT. So, and this number we can actually calculate really, really well. That's one of the things that computational chemistry is actually really good at is calculating geometries and the relative energies of different geometries pretty well. So we can do that actually just straight from the quantum, essentially. There's some approximations in there, but we're not, we don't need to plug in any measured numbers other than Planck's constant and the speed of light, basically. Um, and then that means once we get here, R really is, now it's Boltzmann's constant, not uh, Planck's constant, but that's another fundamental constant. So technically this is all calculated, but it's, we can trust it at the same time. Um, and we'll get into those computational methods when we start doing um, computational chemistry next, next quarter, probably. Um, OCHEM, it was OCHEM 3 last year, but we'll be able to take it a little more slowly and mix it in with some of the other labs instead of doing all of the, our computational labs in one quarter. Oh, there's the numbers. Uh, I wasn't that far off. So the one three diaxial interactions for a, a T-butyl group are 22.8, not 40 kilojoules per mole. Um, but that still winds up having a huge effect there. If it's an isopropyl group, we wind up with nine kilojoules per mole um, for the interactions, which gives us a 97 to three ratio. Um, as far as that first one we drew, the isopropyl <clears throat> meth cyclohexane uh, um, would, would have that 97 to 3 ratio. Um, and so, and like I've said before, you don't need to memorize these numbers. Um, I, you know, we can, we can use them if we have them in front of us you, to predict what K would be. I mean, remember equilibrium constant, what's the first rule of equilibrium? So I didn't have you guys for equilibrium, did I? Carl taught you equilibrium. I always like to say the first rule of equal, equilibrium is products over reactants. The second rule of equilibrium is products over reactants. Um, so if you know that you only have one product and one reactant, that makes the ratio really easy to predict if you know K, right? You could do an ice table, but it's going to be a really simple ice table. When we add another substituent, things get more complicated, as you might expect. Um, and so the first thing that we're going to bring in is the fact that when we have two substituents, we have what's known as stereochemistry. When you have two substituents attached to a ring, we can't just freely rotate anymore, right? That ring restricts the rotation. So everything is kind of stuck in the same position relative to everything else, right? Normally, we wouldn't care which direction we were drawing a carbon in when we were drawing our skeletal structure because everything can rotate wherever it wants to be, right? Um, that's not the case once we have a ring structure. So things tend to be stuck in one of either two positions. And this does not depend on chair versus um, boat conformation. There, if you have two things attached to a ring, they're either going to be on the same side of the ring or on opposite sides of the ring, which makes sense, right? When I, when I put it that way, you only have two choices same side or opposite side. And so that's where the, where the term stereo chemistry comes from. Stereo means two, literally. Um, 
And so stereochemistry means you have some point in that molecule where you are, have two possible isomers where all, and they're, they're definitely isomers because they're not the same molecule, but they're not like constitutional isomers where you have things either attached different distances from each other, or you have the same formula, but maybe it's with a methyl group instead of, um, instead of being straight chain. Stereo, stereo isomers have all the same bonds and pretty much the same, the same distance from each other. So in both of these, this would be one, two dimethyl cyclohexane in both of these cases. But because we can't name two different molecules, one, two dimethyl cyclohexane, we need to have a way of differentiating between these two compounds. All right, and so we use the term cis and trans. Cis means that things are on the same side. of something we'll use this for alkenes as well that anything where you have um where you can't have free freely rotating um carbon chains we can use this cis and trans nomenclature um, if they're on opposite sides from each other if you have to go through the ring to get from one to the other that's trans a trans isomer so we just stick that in front of our normal naming system for this. Instead of naming it as um, just 1,2-dimethylcyclohexane, we would say cis 1,2-dimethylcyclohexane or trans 1,2-dimethylcyclohexane. Right, so it's a little bit like using those prefixes like isopropyl, um, except that we need these, there's not a, another way of, of indicating which of these compounds is which, um, like there was with isopropyl or tert-butyl. So, any, so anytime you've got two things on a ring structure, we're going to use this nomenclature to indicate which one's up and which one's down. So if we're looking at those same two, how do we know which one is more stable? Or in other words, how can, let's try and draw the most stable chair compromer for both of these and see if one of them is going to have, is going to be significantly more stable than the other, if they're going to be about the same stability. So I'll give you a second to do that and then I'll start working through it. All right, the green marker has been banished to my children's easels. I never realized how helpful it was to have those easels. And I always just thought that, you know, they're, they're cool. The kids like them for drawing on and stuff. I didn't think they were, they took up a lot of space. But now ha homeschooling a little bit, having a whiteboard like this big that I can like, you know, write something out for my son to copy so he can spell things the right way. It's really helpful. All right, so if we're trying to draw, let's start with the cis isomer. So the skeletal structure of the cis isomer.
is going to look something like this. Let me zoom, zoom back in on the board. And it doesn't matter where we put the two substituents, they just need to be next to each other. So our skeletal structure would look like this. So both of them on the same side of the ring. Both of, if the ring is flat, both of these are coming out towards us. So then if we wanted to draw the chair conformer, start by drawing your chair structure. And then if we put one of the methyls up on the point on the headrest here, the other methyl is going to have to be next to it, but we might as well put one of them in the easy position, right? So if we're starting here, if, if let's say this carbon is the headrest. If this carbon is the headrest, then our two positions that we could choose from are either there or there, right? So if we're trying to keep the same configuration, like take this and rotate it sideways, that would mean that this, that our methyl group would be pointed upward. And then we ha just have the hydrogen here. That means when we come to adding our second methyl group, we need to figure out we have two possibilities. So almost treat these like it's a true false question. There are two possible ways. It could either be axial or equatorial. Our equatorial position would be coming out towards us. Our axial position would be straight downward. So which of those two possibilities puts the methyl on the same side of the ring relative to this methyl? First off, which of these is axial? I, I kind of already said it. This one's the axial and this one's the equatorial, right? So axial or equatorial for the second carbon? Ax axial? If we did axial, that would put it on the opposite side of the ring from this one, right? If you picture taking this and flattening it out, that would put them in the trans configuration. So it's going to have to be in the equatorial position. Which means we have a hydrogen there. So we have one of our methyls in an axial position, one of them in an equatorial position. If we do a chair flip here, this side of the molecule just flips the other direction, right? So because everything's the same on this side, it doesn't really matter. It's going to flip up this way. This side, when it flips downward, this position goes from being axial, and now our two possible places we could have it. When we flip this down, the methyl stays in the same position relative to the other carbons. So we wind up with the methyl now in the equatorial position, and the hydrogen is pointed downward just by taking this and rotating it like that. Like that. This one's a little bit trickier to see what's going to happen because this we don't draw this carbon as moving. But if you know that this bond is going from up and away from us, 
to down and away from us, what's going to happen to everything else? These two are going to sort of rotate upward. Because as this headrest goes down, these are still going to try and stay away from it. So I'm trying to use two hands and keep my hands out of the way of the diagram here. So this is the headrest, and here's my other two. Here are my two substituents. As the headrest goes down, these have to rotate up to stay out of the way. The easiest way to memorize it, or just the rule to remember, it's not memorizing, the rule to remember is that whatever was axial is now equatorial and vice versa. In order to stay out of the way here, the one that was axial, when this is rotated down, it kind of, it's now sticking straight up. And the hydrogen that was sticking down goes to point out towards us now. So is one of these significantly more stable than the other form? We went from having a methyl in the axial and a methyl in the equatorial to having a methyl in the axial and a methyl in the equatorial. Should be identical, right? Yeah, these, these two conformers, we can draw them differently, but they have the same energy. So neither of these is favored. What happens if it's the what happens if it's trans? So in your notes, you don't have the luxury of just using your thumb to, to wipe away your dry erase. And that's good because you get practice redrawing your cyclohexanes anyway. I'll redraw it anyway. So if we put the first methyl in the same position as it was, and for the second methyl, we still have the same two possibilities, right? The two positions attached here are straight down or coming out towards us. If it was coming out towards us, that would still be the cis conformer, right? Or sorry, isomer. It's not a conformer, that's an isomer. So if we want them on opposite sides of the ring, we need to have one facing up, one facing down, one above the ring, one below the ring. So now when we do our ring, so now instead of having one axial, one equatorial, we have both of them axial, right? Significantly less stable than one axial and one equatorial. But what's going to happen when we do a ring flip? We're going to wind up with both of them switching positions, right? If they were both axial here, now when we do the ring flip, they're going to both be equatorial. So when we flip that downward, we wind up with
this methyl that was sticking up is now sticking over, hydrogen sticking down. This one, that hydrogen now is going to rotate up and the methyl is going to rotate out towards us. Sean, could you draw the wedges in the ring structure in blue? Oh, so yes, let's, so this one would be, if we're looking at from the point of view of this carbon, this would be the dashes basically. It's going away from us into the board. And on this one, from, from the same point of view of that carbon, this bond is going away from us. This, so this one's coming towards us. Because remember, our rules for tetrahedral carbons is two flat bonds, one going away, one coming towards us. And the ones going away and coming towards us have to be pointed in more or less the same direction. All right, so. That's why our two bonds that were flat in this case were these two are in the plane of our flat. This one is going away from us to go back to, to complete that ring structure, which means our equatorial one is coming out towards us. So if you don't know where the various bonds are, Remember the ring structure comes first. You have to make the ring structure a ring, right? And then fill in whatever's missing to give you that two flat bonds, one away, one coming towards. So like if we were looking at this carbon back here, the ring structure, this is the carbon that's on the far side of the ring from us, right? Which means this bond has to be coming towards us. If this bond's coming towards us, this bond, there are two possibilities. It could be flat or it could be going away from us, right? But if it's going away from us, that's not gonna be completing the ring, right? If this other carbon carbon bond was going away from us, how do you get a ring without it coming back towards itself? So our two possibilities, so if this one's flat, this one's coming towards us, we must have one going away from us that's roughly the same position, roughly pointed the same way. And the last bond that we're missing is the other flat bond, which has to be not pointed this way and not pointed this way. So it's gonna be pointed that way. Right, so it's, it's sort of a, layers of process of elimination. Remember that your tetrahedral always needs two flat, one away, one towards you. And then once you get that, now we, that we have these other two drawn, we can say, okay, and now I know one of those has to be axial and the other one has to be equatorial. If you're trying to label which is which. Okay, out of these choices, this one's definitely more in this pointed perpendicular to the ring than that one. So this would be our axial and this would be our equatorial. And that also does kind of show why when they're axial, you get those interactions, right? If there was another methyl here, it would be pointed in roughly the same direction as this methyl. And so any big groups that are both axial are going to wind up interacting with each other, pushing each other away but something in this position is not gonna be interacting with that methyl, right? They're able to stay away from each other more.
So to go back to our original question, our original question was out of these two possible conformers, and I didn't leave myself much room here. Is one of them significantly more stable than the other? So this one had two chair conformations, both had one axial, one equatorial. One methyl was axial, one methyl was equatorial, no matter how we drew our chair conformation, right? This one, we, we drew one chair conformation where they were both axial, which would be our least stable possibility, right? This one, we were, but then when we flipped it, we got both of our methyls into the equatorial position. This is more stable than either of the other options. Our options are two equatorial, one equatorial, one axial, sorry, two axial, one equatorial, equatorial and one axial or two equatorial. This is the most, most stable conformer, which means this is the more stable isomer. It has a, a conformer that is significantly lower in energy than either of the possibilities for this one. So when I got rid of my bad green marker, I grabbed a, another red one that my kids have been using. And the thing they don't tell you about kids is that literally everything is sticky for the first six years of their lives. I don't even know what it is. Their doorknobs are sticky. The floor is sticky. My dry erase pen is sticky. So if you see me struggling to pull the lid off of that one, that's why. And I just really hope it's a gummy bear or something. All right, let's do, let's take our break. That was fairly dense. We'll take a break and we'll come back. And you, you guys are going to draw both possibilities for this molecule. All right, so 10 minutes, come back at five till.
Sean, did I miss anything critical? I had some internet struggles. So um, you saw us go through both of the stereo isomers for methyl for dimethyl cyclohexane, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I was. I just asked you to do the wedges. Yes. The, yeah. So, I think um, I have to do that. Otherwise, like, I'm still kind of having trouble quickly visualizing what's going on, especially with the ring. Yeah, and that's that's the key is is to remember that if you draw the ring first and draw the wedges for the ring the right way yeah. in a way that makes sense to your head, then yeah. then figuring out axial and equatorial is a lot easier. Gotcha. And then the the only other thing that we that we did after that was um, we then went through and said, okay, well, this confirmation, no matter what we did, we had one axial and one equatorial methyl group, right? So there was no favorite yeah. favorite for this, for the trans isomer, we could get both axial or both equatorial, which means yeah. this is going to be way more stable than either of the others. Gotcha. So this actually was a more stable isomer than the cis because we can get one of those conformers that's significantly more stable. Gotcha. Yeah. Would you say the conformer with both of them in the axial position, that's like the least stable out of the four? Yeah. So they're not interacting with each other. Um, let me go back to the share screen though. They're not interacting with each other because they're always kind of pointed away from each other. Either one's axial, one's equatorial, or they're both kind of, they're still either, they're both on the opposite sides of the ring. Um, but if you go back to this one that had the numbers here, a methyl group, each methyl group when it had those diaxial interactions was at 7.6 kilojoules per mole less stable. And so, and that would give us a 95 to five ratio. If we have, if we had the cis and no matter what we did, we had one axial and one equatorial, we're going to have those 7.6 kilojoules per mole of unfavorable interactions, no matter what we do. And if we use the trans, the diaxial, we have double that. We have 15 kilojoules per mole unfavorable interactions when they're in the diaxial position versus none of those unfavorable interactions when we when we have it set up here. So this one's going to be gotcha. way more stable by seven points. It's going to be more stable than this than the cis isomer by 7.6 kilojoules per mole. And this conformer is more stable than the axi diaxial conformer by 15.2 kilojoules per mole. Okay. Would you call um would you call both of those diaxial, where in the cis form you have one axial, one equatorial? And then in the trans, you can have it to where they're both axial in the opposite directions, right? So I'm going to switch the color scheme here and yeah. draw all the ones that are interacting that are interacting above the ring with red and the ones that are interacting below the ring in blue. So this methyl group has diaxial interactions with these two hydrogens. Uh, okay, gotcha. This methyl group has diaxial interactions with these two hydrogens. Gotcha, but not with each other. Not with each other. Yeah. Methyl groups. Yeah. If we had them so that instead of being one, two dimethyl, it was one, three dimethyl, then we could have them both bumping into each other and that'd be even less favorable. Okay. Gotcha. This is hard. It takes a lot of practice. That's why we're, we're taking our time with it. Yeah. And my mouse code, there we go.
All right, so as everybody's getting back here, let's you let's practice. You guys do this one. I just walked through one that looked very similar to this. If you've got the trans um, isomer of chloromethyl cyclohexane, one, two, chloromethyl cyclohexane, draw both possible conformers, both possible chair conformers, and let's predict which one's going to be more stable. Also, I should give you guys heads up. If anybody lives on Lodi Street in South Lake Tahoe, you're about to lose power all day. Um, I found out there's a planned power outage, but your liberty is not always the best at getting a hold of people, especially if you're renting. Um, there's a planned power outage from nine to five on Lodi Street today, which I know is kind of right in the middle of all Tahoe. So um, if you guys disappear in five minutes, I'm going to assume it's because your power went out, not because you just are are spent. And again, this one's going to look very similar to the one we just did, but try to do it without going back to your notes if you're feeling like you want to try and work your way through it on your own. So you're not just recopying what we did a second ago. So first things first, get your cyclohexanes drawn, or at least one of them. And then we just kind of have to pick which of these we're going to we're going to say is above the ring versus below the ring. And if you wanted to draw your wedges here. So you can remember what the ring looks like. Sometimes just, just really bolding that front edge of the ring is enough to make it remind you that it's 3D, what the bonds look like. Because the trick is if you make your wedges too big when you're drawing your ring structure, then you don't leave yourself anywhere to, if you're going to add wedges to this, there's nothing, how do you make them look even bigger? So you have to kind of be a little bit careful, learn some of the tricks. Uh, 
Oh, yeah, let's say we took this molecule. And we're just going to take it and rotate it so that this carbon is our headrest. So then if we have our two our two possibilities here, we already have a bond coming out towards us and a bond going away from us. So our two possibilities here are both in the plane of the board. The way it's drawn here, we had chlorine above the ring. So let's keep it that way for now, just for the sake of making it easy to see. So if the chlorine's above the ring, I would put it in that position. Actually, I'll switch to using colors here. There's our chlorine. Our two possibilities for the methyl are we have one bond that's flat, one bond going away from us. So we have a bond coming towards us. and another bond that's flat. So which one of those gets the methyl group, top or bottom? Right, because the chlorine was a, is above the ring. If picture this ring being flattened out, the chlorine would be sticking up above the ring, which means the methyl group has to be downward. Another pattern that's helpful with these is that in a chair conformer, every one of these carbons has one, one of its substituents is sticking straight up or straight down in the plane of the board and they alternate. So if this one has a bond sticking straight up, this one's got a bond sticking straight down. This one's got a bond sticking straight down. And then they, these ones are sticking straight up. And this one's got a bond sticking straight down. So that even makes it a little bit easier to see. Now we just have to add, okay, what's the one, the ones on the points, the one that's not straight up or down is going to be still flat, but outward. Olivia? Yeah, thanks. Um, so if we did the chair flip on the one that you just drew the bonds on, uh, the one on the right. Yeah. So if we flipped it back to the one on the left, all of those bonds would reverse kind of exactly so okay. the one that, well as far as drawing it they would reverse really the one this one that's equatorial here would that would now be the one that's straight down over there mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense yeah right so as far so when i say that they're always just going to alternate that means just for drawing them every one of these carbons has one that you can draw just as a straight line that's either up or down. And that only, and then there, these four carbons in the middle have a bond that's either coming towards us or going away from us. And these ones on the corners, the last bond is flat going out away from us, away from the ring. I mean, right, so just as far as learning how to draw these. And again, process of elimination, if you know that there's an easy bond to draw on all six of these, figuring out where the last one goes is even a little bit easier. Sean, that blue wedge, does that go away from you or towards you? No, that's coming towards us because this bond is going away from us. And so that's what I meant about being careful with drawing the wedges on the ring is you also need to, there's going to be something coming away from the ring towards us from here. So we need to make it e look even bigger as it's coming further towards us. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Because this, 
from the point of view of this carbon, the, the two bonds to the ring structure are going away from us and towards us. So this one's coming towards us, and then we have a, but from the point of view of this carbon, this bond goes backward, right? Because we, we took a step forward, basically. And now there's still one more thing coming away from us, and the bond that we drew as a wedge here is going backward relative to this carbon. And this might be one where drawing these, like I said, out. Oh, oh, I didn't get, um, I need to get uh, Mariola on making those structures tomorrow. Um, but uh, let me pull up mold view. Um, so if we had a cyclohexane that has chlorine coming out towards us and methyl group going away from us, you hit 2D to 3D in mold view, like I said, doesn't always. Can you share your screen? Yes, thank you. Thanks. It did not add the hydrogens properly. So apparently I need to explicitly write the hydrogens in here. Let's try that. There we go. So I have it drawn with the chlorine at the top right. Ah, kind of like that, right? No, that's back, that's upside down. So it's going to be reversed a little bit based on how I have it drawn. Um, the right here, the chlorine is, the, is attached to the footrest in the equatorial position. This has already gone through our ring flip. Um, but you, so the, the bond that you were just asking about, John, was, so we have a wedge between this carbon here and this carbon. Then we have another wedge between this carbon and the methyl because it's coming even further towards us. Oops. And that's, that's really where the, where this, um, our wedges and dashes sort of break down a little bit and I might be able to do this. Ah, that looks way worse. Uh, That, that's probably not any easier to see, is it? Uh, it just looked a little crowded with the hydrogens drawn in there. Um, that might be the best. So wed, from the point of view of this carbon, that's the footrest here, there's a wedge coming towards us. From the point of view of this carbon, that what was a wedge is going away from us now. And this carbon is on a wedge coming towards gotcha. us. So it's kind of about where your frame of reference is. Exactly. And those of you who have taken physics know it's all about defining your system, right? It's all about your frame of reference, the whole relativity thing. Um, so, to go back to our example here, when we wanted to take this and go through the chair flip, so in this case, we wind up drawing both of these as being um, axial, right? That's just the way that we set it up when I first grabbed this and, we, and said, okay, I'm trying to take this, I'm gonna take this molecule and flip it on its side, make chlorine be at the head headrest, we drew it and that happened to make it so that both of these were in the axial position. In theory, there's a 50, 50 chance that we get lucky when I draw this and both of them are already in the equatorial position. We drew it in the axial position with both of them in the axial position and we want to draw the more stable conformer. I guess the question just said, draw both of them. Um, but then our next step is going to say, is going to be which one's more stable. 
both of them in the axial position. But if we took this and flip it downward, the chlorine was sticking straight up and now it's going to be sticking away from everything else. And the methyl was sticking straight downward. But as we rotate this down, that bond that's sticking out towards us, that big wedge, as the, as the headrest goes down, this is going to pop up to stay away from everything else, which is going to rotate that methyl group out towards us. Just as a double check, if you did everything right, when you do these chair flips, everything that was axial is now equatorial. And if it was equatorial, it's now axial. Everything flips when you do a chair flip. Right, so axial, axial turns into equatorial, pointed away from everything, and equatorial, pointed away from everything, pointed out towards us. And the hydrogens that were in the equatorial positions are now here and here. Right, so we didn't move the chlorine and the hydrogen relative to each other, they just did that. And same here, we had the hydrogen and the carbon and then when it rotated, they rotated as well. And again, you playing around with some 3D models, um, either on a computer or get uh, um, Mariella working on on making those kits. My my day yesterday get, day got terribly derailed. Um, and nothing went according to plan. And so I did not send that email to Mariola yesterday. Um, but I know she's going to be on campus most of the day tomorrow, I think, helping Kathy with uh, physics labs. Um, so I think she'll be able to work on those tomorrow. Um, and we'll, we'll go from there. Hey, is there a way to look at chair confirmations on Moleview? So to, to not really, unfortunately. It, the, the 3D structures on Moldview are, you can look at them, but there's not really a good way to, um, to manipulate them or change them. All it does is take the 2D and turn it to the 3D. And then you can click and drag around. Um, there is a way, I, you, you can do a little bit with it, but it, you, if you click on this JMOL tab, JMOL is a, um, is a freeware program that's designed for um, doing 3D modeling. It's, you build your structures before you then turn them and plug them around, plug them into um, a calculation software. And it will do very, very basic um, calculations here. Like this one, we can get it to show the dipole of the um, entire molecule. And the bigger the molecule is, the longer this will take to render. Um, if it even shows it at all. Oh, there it is. So it's, it's showing a dipole there, but it won't really let you like click and drag and move these things around. Uh, and if you hit the, the energy minimization thing, it'll basically just try and find the most stable geometry, but it's already in that state right now. So, um, but I cannot get it to come up with to draw it in the less stable conformer. Um, so we will we'll work on that maybe next week in lab. Maybe I'll make that part of our lab next week and be drawing these. And there's a better program thing is you, you have to download it. Um, but it's pretty, it doesn't um, 
it's not spyware or anything and it runs actually better on a Mac than on a PC. Um, so so uh, stability or um, compatibility wise shouldn't be an issue. Um, we'll look at doing that next week so that you guys can actually practice drawing these yourself. All right, let's, and that's more or less what we get. This is what we, the first one we drew has the chlorine and the methyl in the axial position. And then when they flip, when it does the chair flip, we wind up with the methyl pointing towards us now, chlorine pointing away from the ring. And then, um, so both of them in the equatorial. Uh, this is just some of the slides on um, naming these compounds. And keep, make sure I'm giving you guys the right context. Make sure I'm not presenting it wrong. Um, so we use the term stereoisomers to refer to ring structure where we, where we can't rotate freely anymore. Um, and that's, that's one of the first places it showed up. But the other place it shows up is anytime you can't freely rotate any carbon chain, there's going to be a cis isomer and a trans isomer. Um, and so the other place we see that is with pi bonds. Because remember that this, the shape of a pi bond looks like this, right? The sigma bond is directly in between the two nuclei. The pi bond has to be above and below the, the sigma bond, right? And that means if you tried to rotate a pi bond the way we rotate a sigma bond, you would actually break the bond, right? Because you can't have any overlap. If you have your overlap because these two things are lined up in, a, in an eclipsed configuration, basically, if you actually took that and rotated it, now you can't have any overlap if these things are 90 degrees to each other, right? And if you can't have any orbital overlap, then you can't have a pi bond. So pi bonds won't freely rotate the way that sigma bonds do, which means we also get cis and trans for pi bonds. Pi bonds are gonna have a similar property where you can wind up with that your substituents that are attached to the carbon can be on the same side, which we call cis, or the opposite side, which we call trans. Right? Just like with the ring structure, you guys see the similarities? Um, the other way, and so we're gonna skip over this for now, we're not gonna learn about naming alkenes, which are carbon, carbon, pi bonds yet. Um, the reason I want to go over this is because there's another type of stereoisomer that is also, you have to be able to visualize these things in 3D to be able to see it well. Um, and so that's, it's what's called a chiral carbon. Um, and a chiral carbon means that you've, if you've got an sp3, it's not always carbon, and if you have an sp3 atom that has four different things attached to it, then it's what's known as chiral. And this, this comes as a result of, of basically us being um, organisms that uh, exist in three dimensions or think in three dimensions. Um, if you have four objects arranged in three dimensions, you can wind up with a non-superimposable mirror image, which sounds like a mouthful, but it just basically means it's, it's like your right hand versus your left hand. Your right hand versus your left hand are the same, right? They're mirror images of each other, but you can't put your right hand into a left-handed glove. Right? At least it wouldn't fit right. It's, that's usually where somebody pipes up and says, oh, I can put my right hand into a left-handed glove. But they're just trying to be contrary. Um, and so that's what the, what's meant by a non-superimposable mirror image is this idea that you can have all the same atoms connected all the same way, 
and yet it's not the same molecule because you can't wind up rotating it around in a way where you could make everything look the same. Um, so for instance, on if you took if you took mirror image of glasses, it's they're still glasses, right? You could take them, you could take this picture, this um, item, and if you just took it and twist and rotated it, it would look like this one, right? But if you make it so you can tell the difference between those two sides, now taking the mirror image of it, this, this model on the left, you've got the right lens is missing. And the model on the, on the right, the left lens is missing. Those are no longer the same thing when you take the mirror image. Because we added something that made it different between the right hand and the left hand. Or for those of you who, who've ever worn glasses, um, if you mess up the earpiece, the side, the uh, temple piece on, on your glasses, um, it's all, you can always tell when you put those on, right? And it's always, you might get used to it, but it's the right, you know, it's the right hand side that's messed up on mine, or it's the left hand side. If somebody took your glasses and mirror image them and messed up the left hand side and fixed the right hand side, you'd know when you put them on, right? it wouldn't be the same as it was. Um, and anybody who's ever worn glasses knows that you mess up your glasses sometimes and then you get so used to it that when you get new glasses, it feels totally weird to not have a messed up pair of glasses. Um, these these mirror images, these non superimposable mirror images really actually wind up being really important in terms of biochem. Because biochem and enzymes in general are designed to have these three dimensional binding sites where different molecules will fit into that binding site and bond to and form favorable interactions with various amino acids that are part of that, that enzyme. And it's a lot like the, the model that gets used is um, putting a key into a lock. It's also a lot like putting your hand into a glove. If you have the mirror image of that molecule, it doesn't work as well. Uh, you may not have looked at your key. You think of your key as being kind of a flat 2D object, right? But it's got those weird grooves in it, right? If you had a mirror image of your house key, it wouldn't unlock your door because all those grooves would be backwards, right? And same thing with your hand fitting it into a glove. That's, a, that's the analogy. I get tired of using the same analogies over and over again, because you guys will have heard it in other classes or you'll go on to hear it again and again other places. Um, but that's really the best example is you can't put your right hand into a left-handed glove or left, right foot into a left, hand, left shoe. Right, and so that really affects your the biochemistry of these molecules. For instance, this is the, the classic example um, is carvone, which is this molecule here, which has a right-handed and a left-handed isomer. The right-handed isomer called R-carvone um, is the molecule that smells like spearmint. The left-handed molecule doesn't smell anything like spearmint, it smells like caraway. Um, and it really, really confused my brain when we did a synthesis when I was in OCHEM where we made both of these at the same time. Um, because you don't think spearmint and caraway smell all that much alike until you smell them mixed together. And then for about six months after that lab, I couldn't tell the difference between caraway and spearmint. They were so jumbled up in my head from that lab that it took me a long time to actually be able to smell the difference again. Um, but they, and they are significantly different because they're each gonna bind to different smell receptors in your, in your nose because one of them's gonna go to the right-handed binding site and the other one's gonna go to the left-handed binding site. Um, and so those two, when you have stereoisomers that are chiral, 
that are right-handed versus left-handed. And that's, again, when you have a carbon that has four different objects attached to it, um, they call those enantiomers. Enantiomers just means non-superimposable mirror images. So right-handed versus left-handed. So here's an, a good example in terms of biochemistry. If you have a, a carbon that's got four different things attached to it, say, a, and let's say it's an amino acid, you've got a hydrogen and a, an amine group and a carboxylic, deprotonated carboxylic acid. If, they're, if it's designed to fit into an active site that looks like this, switching two of those things means the rest won't match. Right? You can't put the amine and have it bond with the hydrophobic region in a binding site. And you can't put that, take the hydrogen and have it bond to a negative charge on, on the binding site. And no matter what you do, taking this right-hand molecule, it seems like you've got all the same pieces. It seems like you should just be able to take it and twist it around and rotate it to make it so everything fits in the right spot. But try to do that visually. If you want to put the... If you want to put the amine over here, when you do that, you're going to push the hydrogen over to the red spot and you're going to move this carbo carboxylate over here, right? You're going to twist the whole bottom of the molecule, which now, now the amine matches up, but the hydrogen and the carboxylate don't. If you took it and flipped it over the, the other way, you're going to wind up, no matter what you do, it's like trying to put your right hand into a left-handed glove. It just doesn't work. No matter how you twist your hand around, you can't get your thumb in the right spot without having the glove on backward, right? In theory, you could put your thumb, you could put all the right fingers in the right hole, putting your right hand into a left-handed glove if you switched the palm in the back of the glove. If you had it backwards, you could do that, but then it's still not going to work right, right? The part that's grippy is going to be on the outside, and the part that you use to wipe your nose when you're skiing is on the on your palm now. At least my gloves look like that. I have a question, Sean. Yeah. So then is there a version of a the knitted gloves where it's like you can stick them on any hand? The little kid knitted gloves? So is there like so, a compound that's like that where it can just, it's malleable to anything? It's not, wouldn't necessarily be malleable, but if you had something that was flat, if you didn't have an SP3 carbon, if it was SP2 and it was planar, then uh, the top and the bottom would be the same, right? Yeah. And then you could do that as far as the molecule and your binding site could be the same too. Um, so it's, it's anytime you've got that, and it comes from that constraint of if you have four things to arrange in three dimensions, one of them has to be above the other three, right? If you think of the first three as defining a plane, the other one has to be either here or here. If you put it in the plane, now all of a sudden it doesn't matter anymore. And that's what an SP, why an SP2 atom doesn't have this. It is kind of interesting to think about that a two-dimensional creature might view a three-dimensional object as being, you know, an SP2 carbon might have chirality because it either goes, it's either cis or trans, for instance. And you can't go back and forth between them if you're a 2D organism. If you're limited to only working in two dimensions and you have something here or something here, you know, here versus here, you wouldn't necessarily be able to go back and forth between them, right? Which then begs the question, if a three-dimensional organism has this constraint because we have four objects in 3D, what about a four-dimensional organism? Could, that, could they rearrange things in a way that our brains are not even possible, you know, can't even comprehend, aren't even built to be able to understand? You could see how that extension of a 2D organism to a 3D organism could be extended to 
a 4D organism. We don't even know what that would look like. Um, but I guess- You're talking about aliens, right? Yeah, or potentially, or, or you know, intelligent life in a, in a different version of the universe. It was where the fourth dimension, if the fourth dimension is time, if time could move backwards or, and forwards, it will. Then in theory, you could move backwards and forwards between the two stereoisomers potentially by just taking it off on one side and attaching it on the other. They might view that as just rotating it in their head. But it's, um, it's fun to think about the limitations of how we perceive the universe sometimes. That's a fun topic to bring up at like 10 o'clock on a Friday night with all your friends. And you know, you really see the ones that like to, to think about this sort of things and the ones that just tell you to, you know, get the hell out, go home. Um, yeah, Arrival is a really good example. Um, how, how lang and that one specifically is looking at how language affects how your brain develops. And there's a lot of in really interesting neuroscience on that as well. Um, a little bit of a digression here, but if um, even within humans, um, the language that you speak influences, or the language that you learn first as you're growing up influences how your brain works in a lot of different ways. Um, there's a, um, a culture, I think it's, and I, I always mix it up. It's either in Australia or in, in, um, in uh, the Kalahari Desert in Africa um, that where their language, their written language is always read from east to west, not from left to right or right to left or top to bottom. It's written, it's written and read from east to west. So interestingly enough, if you actually try to talk to somebody from that culture, they don't know their right hand from their left hand. That's not a distinction that their brains learn to recognize, but what they do have is a perfect sense of direction. Because if, unless you know where north is, you can't read somebody else's writing. Kind of interesting. And that's just within humans. You could think about another intelligent species whose brains worked totally different than ours and also had a very different language, might change how they perceive a lot of things about the universe. All right, can you guys think of two other examples of everyday objects that are chiral, where the mirror image is not the same object? We've done shoes, gloves, and um, glasses. What else is there? So hands are in that category, right? Let's, yeah, let's, let's get a little more creative than that. Can we, can we think anything else? Your feet. Your feet. <laughs> Would it, would it maybe be looking at the front of the car because you could distinguish which side is the left side and right side? Yeah. But if you took the mirror image of your car, then the drivers, then the steering wheels on the right hand side instead of the left hand side. So cars would be chiral. They don't look like it from the outside necessarily. But if you consider where you would sit to drive, then absolutely. Yeah, non-symmetrical pictures and books and stuff like that. <laughs> pictures, you might not know that it's been flipped, but if you took a mirror image of a pic of a picture, it's like when somebody um, sends, sends you, so when smartphones, I can't open that. You're going to have to ask mom to open that. Okay. Um, if you, if, you know, in the, in the old days of selfies, if you used your front camera and it mirror imaged it so that you could see it, it didn't unmirror image it when you sent it to somebody, right? And so you could tell when somebody took a picture um, because their phone would be backwards or they would, you know, they would, uh, the writing on their shirt would be backwards when they sent or you that you, picture. if you had the earring in your left ear, it would look like it was in your right ear kind of thing, right? Exactly. Exactly. So, so writing is going to be, um, is, generally chiral because if you took the mirror image of a page of a textbook you're not going to be able to read it right some of the letters are going to look the same if you take the mirror image of an a it still looks like an a but if you take the mirror image of an f it's backwards right so anything you can write backwards where the there's a backwards version of that letter is going to be chiral and when you think about it it's because there are four distinct sides to that letter, right? 
or at least three distinct sides. Like you can tell the left hand side of an F from the right hand side of an F. And you can tell the top of an F from the bottom of an F. So anytime you have an any atom that has four different substituents is going to meet this this criteria and that atom that is in the center of that is called the chiral center or an asymmetric center or a chiral carbon or an asymmetric carbon um and so that that is really what we're going to do for the last 15 minutes here is try to visualize some of these molecules and learn how to name them. Because if we can tell the difference between the right handed version and the left handed version, you need to be able to say The right you need to be able to name it in an unambiguous way right where somebody would always get the right stereo isomer. So, but let's start by just finding asymmetric centers. So anytime you've got four different things attached to the same atom. And we can immediately eliminate a big chunk of these, right? They can't have four different things attached if you don't have four electron groups. If it's not sp3, you can throw it out. If it's sp3, but some of the things that are attached to it are the same, it's not going to be chiral. So any CH3s, any anything at the end of a carbon chain is basically not going to be chiral, right? Because you've got CH3. This carbon right here in the middle, or next to the two I just crossed out, it has a methyl attached, it has this other group attached. The other two things that are attached though are hydrogens. If you can't tell the difference between them, that's not an asymmetric center. The ox this oxygen here has is sp3, has two different things attached to it, but what are the other two things attached to this oxygen? Lone pairs. Lone pairs. We can't tell the difference between lone pairs, right? So that oxygen doesn't count. Are, are there four different things attached to this carbon right here? You've got a benzene ring attached. You've got a carbon, then a benzene ring, which is going to be different, right? Both of them have a benzene ring, but they're not identical. You've got an oxygen attached, and then you've got this other long group over here attached. So that's a, a chiral carbon. How about this one? They have two hydrogens attached. Two hydrogens attached. Most of the time when you're ruling these out, it's going to be because you have two hydrogens attached. It's going to be the number with the carbons, especially that's the number one thing that allows you to rule it out. Is it two hydrogens are attached. Or more hydrogens, any methyls. We can cross off. So we only have three heavy atoms left, right? That oxygen is sp2, so it's not going to be in there. How about this carbon right here? We've got a methyl group, a carbon, then a nitrogen, a carbon, then a bunch of other stuff. So those two carbons are distinct from each other, right? They're not the same and a hydrogen. So we have three different types of carbons attached 
to each, to that atom and one hydrogen. So that's an asymmetric center. There's two more left. Are either of them asymmetric centers? No, I don't think. Because the that one carbon, yeah, right there would have two hydrogens. Yeah. And then the nitrogen has, I'm not super confident about that one, but I think it's a no because of the so two. two methyls. It's got two methyls attached. That's the other really common one that we see where they're identical is if it's, you, if you have two CH3s attached, you can't tell the difference between those two methyls. It does have, it's got three different substituents attached to this nitrogen. You've got the rest of this whole big molecule. You've got a methyl, you've got a lone pair. And then if it had a hydrogen attached instead of the second methyl, it would be an asymmetric center. Because you would have lone pair, hydrogen, methyl, rest of the molecule. I've got a quick question. Yeah. So basically, like one of the rules is it has to be SP3, right? Yep. And it has to have four, uh, all four bonds have to be different. Is that basically it? Correct. Okay. You need four different, in order for this to happen, in order for it to be a non-superimposable mirror image, you need four distinct objects attached. Okay. If you don't have four distinct objects attached, then it's, then when you take a mirror image, it'll be, you'll be able to rotate it around some way to make it look the same way as it started. Okay. So for instance, if we, where the, this one go? If you look at the chair here, if you took a mirror image of a chair from the side, it's very obvious that you could just take that and superimpose it, right? Move it over. What if you took, if you took a chair and you took a mirror image of the back of it, then it would look different at first glance, right? You'd have a chair facing left and a chair facing right. But if you want to make the chair facing left look like the other off side of it, you just take it and rotate it, right? And now you have two chairs facing right that are the same. So that's an example of if you take a mirror image of something that doesn't have, that's not chiral, that doesn't have four distinct objects or four distinct things attached to it, when you take that mirror image, it might look different at first, but you can just spin it around or flip it over and get back to where you started. If you do try to do that with, um, with your hands or with, with a chiral molecule, there is no way that you can do that. When you take the mirror image, you wind up with this situation where no matter what you do, you can't put them back in the right spots, right? So you need four different things or else you don't meet the criteria for this. All right, so we have seven minutes left. We're doing just fine because if you can get the hang of rotating these things around in your head, which is what we've been practicing, then naming them is actually not too bad. Things, it's a little bit harder than cis versus trans because cis versus trans, you could just look at it when it's 2D and you could see, see it. Um, we're gonna start, if we're gonna try to name these, we're gonna name them using this R or S configuration, R, is, um, I actually don't know what the word is that they made it stand for, but you can think of it as right-handed. And S stands for the, the uh, Latin for left-handed is sinister, um, which I always make a point of reminded, reminding my left-handed brother about. Um, so if, so that's gonna be our way we name it. We're gonna name it as though it's right-handed or left-handed, R and S. And so the way we're going to do that is start by assigning priority to all the substituents. And the way we do this so that it, it is consistent is we just use atomic number. Whatever's attached 
to your chiral carbon, you're going to assign priority based on whatever, whatever has the highest atomic number. Not the weight of the entire thing, the atomic number of what's, whatever's closest, whatever's directly attached. And then if there's a tie, you go one atom further out. And if it's still a tie, you go one atom further out until you get to something where it's not a tie, where one of them has a higher atomic number than the other. And then once we assign priority, we take the molecule and we spin it around so that whatever is number four is pointed away from us into the board. And then you just draw an arrow from one to two to three it's either going to go clockwise or counterclockwise. If it's going clockwise, that's right-handed, so we'd name it R. If it's counterclockwise, then it's left-handed, and we name that S. Right. so if we, if we have this priority with this, we call this a toy model where it doesn't actually have um, anything there. If we just say one, two, three, four, when we go through and we, we assign priority, um, the next step is to take the four and spin it so it's away from us. Right now it's pointed towards us. So we want to spin it so that it's away from us. We take that molecule and twist it, right? Twist it vertically. S spin it so that four is away from us. Two goes where four is. Three goes where two is. You guys see how I did that? You take that and you rotate the green one to the back. And that and we you leave one where it is. It's like that spinning fan blade that we've talked about. I've used that as an analogy before. Speaking of fan blades, that's another chiral object. Because if you took the mirror image of a fan blade, it would move the air backwards when it spun. Or screws for that matter. If you take the mirror image of a screw, that's a reverse threaded screw. So that lefty tidy and righty loosey. Um, so inclined planes, screws in general, are going to be um, a fit that, that uh, category as well. Um, once we get this spun so that four is pointed away from us, then we just draw one to two to three which is going clockwise for this molecule. So we would name this one R. So let's do one, let's do this, um, one of the simpler examples here. Let's do this middle one. And it can be advantageous to redraw it where the asymmetric center is blown up so that you can see everything attached to it. All right, so I'll give you guys a second to write that down while I do it on the board, and then we'll go through this and be done for the week. So if we're just, if we're starting, if we're gonna name this molecule, you can start by doing your naming the regular way. Figure out your longest carbon chain, figure out what branches or halogens you have and put it on there with the numbers. So this would be pentane. And be two chloro pentane. But because that carbon is an asymmetric center, because that carbon has four different objects attached to it, I almost said five, that would have been blasphemous. We can tell the difference between the four things attached here, so we need to give it R versus S. Because if we took the mirror image of this molecule, it wouldn't be the same. All right, so. 
I'm going to take this and just redraw it, leave everything where it is more or less, and just draw everything that's attached. And this is going to be one, two, three, so C three H. What does that wind up being? Two, two, H seven. Right. So the the idea here is we we expand that asymmetric center so we can tell where everything is, including drawing the hydrogen. And so now we can go around and we assign priority. And like, and the rule for priority is it's higher priority if it has a higher atomic number. So lowest atomic number, the atomic number is based on number of protons, right, in the nucleus. So if we had a lone pair in here, that would automatically be four, the lowest priority, because it doesn't have any protons. If you don't have a lone pair, hydrogen is always going to be your lowest priority. So hydrogen is four. Carbon, carbon, chlorine. Chlorine's highest atomic number, right? Chlorine's what, 17? <laughs> then we have tie here. We've got a methyl group on one side and we've got a propyl group on the other side. So first things first, and if I blow this up a little bit and write it as CH2, CH2, CH3. Our first step, we get a tie. They're both carbons. So if there's a tie, you just go one step further. And here you have to get a hydrogen if you go one step further, right? In any direction. If you go this way, there are two, two ways you could step that you get a hydrogen. We're always going to go the way that tries to break the tie, if you want to think of it that way. We're going to go the direction of the highest atomic number. So carbon, then a hydrogen, carbon, then another carbon. So that makes our propyl group number two. and our methyl group third priority. All right, at this point, if you just redrew it with just one, two, three, four, that's not a bad idea because that's gonna make things a lot simpler to visualize. If we wanna put four into the board away from us, we can pick any way to do that we want, we just have to make sure we don't break any bonds when we're doing it. So it's always going to be like spinning a fan blade. And like I said, we can do that however we want. We could keep three in the same spot and spin these, these three objects here. We could keep two in the same spot and spin the, these three. We could keep, we can't keep the chlorine in the same spot because it's where we want the hydrogen to be. But either way, all we're going to do is if the, if my pointer is the hydrogen, we want to put the hydrogen away from us and keep everything else where it's supposed to go. So in the way we can draw that is just draw a little arrow if you're trying to show what you're doing here. You don't need to do this once you get good at showing how to rotate these around. And I know I'm a, I'm a couple minutes over, but almost done with this. So then when we redraw it, we get two is in the same spot. We put four away from us and up. We put Chlorine, number one, is now down into the right and coming out of the board and up is priority three.
once you get it here, that's the hard part is the assigning priority and then really it's the rotating is the hardest part to see visually. Because now all you do is you draw an arrow and, it, and it's either clockwise or counterclockwise. You go one to two to three. It's clockwise. So we would name this, this molecule's full name would be two would be R two chloropentane. We usually put the R in parentheses. I'm not entirely sure why. That's the the convention is put R in parentheses. But if you just wrote R hyphen, that'd be fine too. All right. We didn't get a lot of chance to practice that naming. Um, I'll make sure that the quiz doesn't focus too heavily on R versus S since we spent more of our week talking about cyclohexanes. Um, but it's, you see hopefully how they're related a fair bit, right? It's all about being able to see these tetrahedral shapes in, as 3D objects, which is probably the single hardest thing about organic chemistry is you have to get used to looking at a flat drawing and seeing a three-dimensional object. Um, and they're drawn by people who didn't go to art school. All right, we'll end there. Um, I do have office hours later today or tomorrow if you guys have any questions or want to go over some more practice problems. Um, other than otherwise, I will see everybody on Tuesday. Awesome. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Bye, guys.